Every man has one core question. Do I have what it takes? Men are only forged by fire. It is the hard things that you've been through that you look back on and you go, that was one of the best times of my life. It is risk. We need adventure and we need battle. This is so core to the masculine soul. I grew up in an alcoholic home, so I had a pretty wounded heart. I had a lot of rage issues. I tried to live without love for a lot of years, and I was a very successful, driven guy. But I was just living only tough and no tender. I was a two-dimensional man, not a three-dimensional whole human being. Masculinity is bestowed by masculinity. It's a nourishment that is passed on only by men. You actually can't get it from the boy culture. I think this is the toughest time that I'm aware of to be a young man. Walk into your fears. What are you afraid of right now? Where's the frontier for you? Are you afraid of asking that girl out? Are you afraid of taking that job? Because that is where that deep sense of strength is gonna be developed. And as you walk into that courage and you taste it, you actually want more. John, absolutely fantastic to have you on the show today. Your books have made a profound impact on my life, the life of my community, now the life of my wife and our family as we look at uh, creating our own kingdom and kind of building out our own culture. And my heart for today is just to get to the bottom of what is going on with our young men, right? So. I'm 28. I've been on a, a major journey, as a lot of 28-year-old guys have, through pornography, through fatherlessness of certain degrees. And now as I'm starting to get into a stage of my life where I'm mentoring guys who I feel like I was just in their shoes a, a couple of seconds ago, I'm now faced with some of that responsibility and that weight. So i just love to ask you, what do you think is going on with young men? Is there a crisis? And if so, what do you think is at the, at the root of some of that? Yeah, thanks, Matt. It's actually great to chat with you here. And um, I have three sons who are in your age range. So oh, nice. I got a big heart for what you're talking about. Um, <clears throat> you know what? I've been a therapist for almost 40 years now. And I, I would honestly say that um, I think this is the toughest time that I'm aware of to be a young man. In, in the world right now, in the culture. And and there's a kind of almost like a perfect storm. The loss of the father culture, a lot, just a lot of fatherlessness uh, around that. And then the lack of a culture of what I would call male initiation. Mm. Young men just don't have a place to go to be with men and kind of learn the ways of manhood. Yeah, yeah, and then you throw the technology piece in there, seven hours a day on our phones, like it, it isolates. And so I would just say, yeah, I think it's a rough time yeah. to be a young man in the world right now. So I, I've worked with men in a, in a counseling context for a lot of years. Every man has one core question. Every little boy is asking one question core question. And the question is, do I have what it takes? Do I have what it takes? Can I handle this? And I, it might be an exam at school. It might be asking a girl out, you know, and then it's getting a career, forming a family, maybe, maybe joining, maybe joining the military. Do I have what it takes? Do I, that's the core masculine question. Am I a man? Like, mm -hmm. like, do I have it? Right. And so my grandfather was a really smart guy. He knew what he was doing. He did a couple crazy things with me. He, I had never driven a tractor. And he took me out one day in, in a field. And he kind of showed me how he wanted these, these furrows cut in the field. And, and then he said, I'll see you in a couple hours. And, <laughs> and he just drove off. And, but, and I, I did a terrible job with it because it was the first time. But he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. So a cow had gotten out uh, of the fencing and it just was wandering out in everybody's fields. And um, he told me to go saddle a horse and go get that, go get that steer. And I was really freaked out because 
I was on my own in a sense of having to do it by myself, but he knew he knew what he was doing. And what he was telling me was, John, you have what it takes. Mm. You got this. You got this. And and that is that's just critical in the in the formation of the masculine soul to have someone speak into your life and say, I see you, you got this. Yeah, and there's like two interesting things going on in our culture right now where number one, there's not enough people, whether they're male role models or otherwise, telling young guys that you have what it takes. But then also young guys aren't being put into situations where they can prove that they have what it takes. Do you know what I mean? Like in our attempt to keep people safe and our attempt to minimize risk and, and whatever is you've removed the opportunity for people to prove themselves. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, exactly. It's the comfort culture, right? You can get everything done on your phone. You know, you can order lunch and do your banking and everything's just a click away. But that doesn't that doesn't address this ache in the masculine soul. Give me a challenge. Give me a chance. Put me in. You know, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I want to get in the game. And even if I don't know what I'm doing yet, I I. I can't have my whole world solved by a click. Yeah. Right? I, I need challenge. I need testing. And that's why guys go for sport or they go for motorbikes or, you know, they're looking for something. Yeah. You know, even the <laughs> fight clubs <clears throat> that, that have kind of sprung up, you know, in, in urban cultures, like just looking for something to give me a chance to find out that I have what it takes. Yeah. And it's super interesting because you see it all the time online. Like I operate like in this kind of weird YouTube digital world, as many of us do. And you see young guys kind of fall into different pockets, right? So you you see them fall into like the gym bro culture online. And I I totally get it. Like there's something so mystical about going into the gym one week, picking up 10 kg and then the next week you can do 12 and a half you're like dude i have what it takes there's some real feedback that has moved me along like a linear journey and then you have maybe like the entrepreneurial world where guys like you know they start like a social media agency and it's all about how much money you can make and da 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 and the result and i i can speak to this with the types of conversations i have in this room from people in this building unbelievably successful entrepreneurs. You know, these are young guys at 25 years old who they've got the eight pack, they've got the Tesla, you know, they're doing 50K a month or whatever it is. And they're coming in here and they are totally distraught because they're like, dude, my relationship with my girlfriend has fallen apart. Dude, I'm lonely at nighttime. I feel like I've got nobody to talk to. I've bet the farm on all the worldly measures of success and it's left me with nothing. What do I do next? Yeah. And that is a very common experience for a lot of young men today. So if someone came to you and said, John, what do I do next? What would you begin with? Well, uh, yeah, let me offer a couple thoughts. One is I want you to think about how that question has already gotten answered. Because as you were growing up as a boy through school, you know, with your dad or not with your dad, all that, like your question, do I have what it takes, got answered. And you are now at this point in your life, you're living out how that question got answered. No, you don't. You're an idiot. You'll never make it. You, you know, whatever the um, or, or the question is, you have what it takes if, mm. you know, if you make the money, if you get the beautiful girl. So you got it, guys, you got it. You got to start with how did that question get answered for me? Because you're living that out right now. I guarantee it. 100%. Any guy walks into my office, 100%. He's already got an answer. It's usually a really bad answer, (laughs) right? Um, You know, nobody likes you. Nobody loves you. Don't, don't tell anybody what you're really struggling with. You know, you're weak. It, all of that, that assault on the human heart, right? We live in a war, gang, against the human heart. And and so you got to think about that. You got to think about how did that question get answered for you? Because you're living it out right now. Mm. And then I would, I would say in terms of like next steps, you got to get out of isolation. You got to get some guys 
And it doesn't need to be a bunch of guys. You know, it can be two mates that you guys sit around a fire and have a smoke and talk or, you know, you, you, yeah, you go to the gym, but then you hang out and you talk. You got you to gotta get out of the isolation. You just have to. I would really, really encourage you to look for older men, mm. right? The, and the, the guy down the street that he's kind of quiet, but he's always out there fixing his car, you know, <laughs> Uh, or maybe it is maybe it is the the manager of the football club or somebody you know that you can talk to and say hey I, I got some questions can mm. we get coffee it would be really really good to have an older man in your life so interesting you say that after uh, at the breakfast that you put on or you were a part of whenever you were in Belfast I just happened to sit beside a guy called Sai. I've never met Sai before and it turns out we had this really interesting connection and similar stories and uh, he's been joining me on the podcast and we've started a series where the remit of the series is to interview old men over the age of 70 and I mean like that that's about as as, as broad as the category is we've had you know ex-military guys in we've had ex-prison officers we had a search and rescue and I just felt like I was chatting with a mate the other day. I was like, I feel like an R with these guys has created like a hundredfold exponential impact on my life. And we, yeah. were, we were reflecting back to moments in our life. And I love in your book, whenever you, you talk about people who give you a name, this idea of, of uh, getting a new name and, and a new name being given to you. And we sat in the sauna, me and this guy, a good, a good buddy of mine, and we said, who are some of the people that have given you names in your life? And we went back and we, we said, okay, this guy at 16 said this, this guy at 21 said this, this guy at 25, this guy last week said this to me. Why do you think that is? Why do old men carry such influence over a young man? Okay, so a couple things about the masculine journey. First off, <clears throat> masculinity is bestowed by masculinity. You can't get it from another source. And that's why when the boys are young, you know, somewhere around three years old, he really turns from mom to dad. Mm. And he turns from the comfort and the kindness and the love and the attention of the mother's world. He wants to go into the father's world, a world of danger and excitement and powerful tools and cars. And, you know, <laughs> he wants to gravitate because masculinity is like a food. Mm. It's a nourishment that is passed on only by men. And, and the tough thing is you actually can't get it from the boy culture, you know, because boys will travel around in packs and school and stuff. And that's a good thing. You need friends. You need mates. That's all good. But it, you need a, a source of masculinity that is greater than yourself. And, and I think it happens multiple times, just like you were describing, Matt, like it's it's a teacher that ends up being like really important to you or it's a or it's a trainer or, or a manager. You know, it, it might be a boss at some point. It might be your granddad uh, over time. An identity is bestowed on you. This is mm. who you are. This is what we see. And. And those words that are spoken and the time that is spent together with an older man, this is how it happens, guys. It doesn't happen any other way. And so that's why we're urging the connection with men that you're, you're, you're always talking about on, on your show here. Like that is such a critical source. It's even just to be together. Mm. If you're driving somewhere, if you're taking a walk, just to be together, something's happening. Something's getting passed on from the older guy to the younger guy that's part of masculine formation. Wow, it's really interesting. Just as you were speaking there, like I'm, I'm even just thinking back to like, I had a coffee with a, like a, a, an older successful business guy in the city. And it was at a point in my business whenever I was, you know, had a lot of questions and, and felt like I was at a bit of a dead end. And I had like a 30 minute conversation with, my, with him. And he just spoke certain things and it wasn't like he, he created anything or he invented something about me. It was he just drew my attention to parts of myself. And in doing so, 
I feel like they almost became like supercharged. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's yeah, not yeah. it's it's not something that you get in like an Xbox Live lobby or you know whenever you're on playing Minecraft with the boys. Yeah. It's just it's different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you can seek this out, guys. You really can. I know, I know that in most guys listening to this, they're like, I I don't have that. What do you? I don't have my granddad's not around, or my my dad's not here, or I don't respect him. I understand that, but it's available. So I grew up pretty fatherless. There was a guy that would work on my car. Um, and I finally, I just asked him, would you teach me? Um, I don't know anything about fixing my car. Would you, would you show me? So you can talk to your mechanic, right? And, <laughs> and, and there were teachers that I would go to and say, hey, could I get a little time with you? Like, you can, you can seek this. But Matt, you know that I come at a lot of this from a faith perspective and I'm not big on religion. I actually really don't like religious stuff. I don't think it speaks to men. I think it feels really feminine and kind of weird. Um, but if you get the idea, the basic idea that that God is your father hmm. and that he loves you deeply and that he gave you masculinity, like he wants to affirm your, your masculinity and to let him speak into your life like that can be a life-changing experience it, re it really can and you, you don't have to throw all the religious drapery all over that you just go <laughs> look you have you have a father and and he loves you and he can help you find the way that that's pretty significant mm. so one of the books that you wrote is a book called fathered by god which is just like any good book you can get a lot just for reflecting on the title, you know, like if, if anything, the title is the message. And I know for a lot of guys listening who don't come from a faith background, you know, they're like reaching uh, while they're driving to like turn on Joe Rogan or something at this point because yeah. they're like, nah, nah, nah. Like we, I've, these guys have completely lost me. So flesh that out a little bit for me or like put some skin and bone on it. What I mean, what I mean by that is like, that's quite an airy fairy concept of, you know, being fathered by God. Can you give some examples from your own life? of how that practically looks. Oh yeah, I remember I, I'm a young I'm a young dad. Um and as I said, I grew up in an alcoholic home, so I had a pretty wounded heart. I had a lot of rage issues. Um and now we're starting to have young boys and my rage is coming out at my young boys. And uh I remember standing in the kitchen window one day, just looking out the window and I just said, God I, I need you to father me. Like, I don't know how to do this. And and then what happens after a prayer like that is somebody's going to walk into your life. And for me, uh, it was a male counselor. It was it was an older guy. I just called him up and I said, hey, I got some real rage issues. Can I come talk to you? And he's like, yeah, love, love to. Um, and we actually ended up becoming really good friends over time. But just to have an older guy. So guys, like, don't whip out on that. Like, even <laughs> see, seeing a therapist might be a really good idea for some of you listening right now. Not because your life's blowing up or, or because, you know, you, you fear mental illness. Um, but just to have somebody to process your story with. Mm. So I said the prayer. And then this guy comes into my life. And I knew it was the answer to the prayer. Like, here it is. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the way. And I've done that so many times. My finances, my dad didn't tell me anything about money, mm. nothing. <clears throat> and he kind of blew it. He blew it with his career and everything. And, you know, I forgive him. I, I actually do forgive him. He was a good guy. He just got taken out by the bottle. And, um, but I needed help financially. And so, again, I would just say, God, you are my father. Can you help me here? And again, older guy comes into my life who's who's kind of more the business type guy. And I wasn't attracted to those guys. Sorry, you and I wouldn't <laughs> yeah, have yeah, been yeah. we wouldn't have been friends in in, in university. Like, yeah, if, if 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 the guy didn't have like grease all over his elbows, you were like, nah, this guy's not for me. <laughs> yeah, not interested. But but he knew a lot uh, about like investments and that kind of thing. I just said, hey, I, I really I got some questions. So every time I prayed that prayer, would you father me? I need your help, God. Like he would do that. And he would bring people into my life. 
And and then just to be honest, Matt, just a sense of his love, like that, that God really does love you. He loves the unique way you're wired, um, the crazy things you, you love and the way you are. Like, that's all good stuff, guys. You don't have to become different um, to get to get love. And, and that's a pretty that's a pretty big thought. Just as you were speaking there, I kind of was like thinking back to your relationship with your, your granda and how your granda would kind of put you in situations that were kind of almost out, that put you out of your depth, right? And give you opportunities to prove to yourself that you had what it takes. Do you think that God does something similar for us yeah. as guys? Because, yeah, you know, I, totally. I, a, lot, a lot of young guys that I talk to, they're so hungry for a challenge. Like they want the adventure. They want the crisis. They want to be put, whether it's a, like a, a physical situation, like let's go swimming in the sea during winter or let's go on a massive hike that we're not sure if we're able to do. Like all that's kind of like boxed and romantic. But like, what about some of the more serious parts of life? Like, do you think God will like take people through challenges as a means to like mentor them, if that makes sense? No question. And this is where most people get pissed at God and they misunderstand what he's up to is, you know, from the flat tire to the empty <laughs> bank account to the, you know, our first reaction is, ah, oh, come on. <laughs> come on, God. I thought you were supposed to be good. I thought you were supposed to help. And, and the big turn for me when I realized, oh, you're initiating me. Mm. Men are only forged by fire. Men are only forged by fire. It, it is the hard things that you've been through that you look back on and you go, wow, you know, when we got stuck on that mountain in that rain and we had to get off, like that was a much bigger day than if the sun had just been shining the whole time, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's huge. Or the time you take out that little sailboat, you know, and then the swell comes up and you, you're like, oh my gosh, we're going to die. And, and <laughs> But you get back and you're like, that was one of the best times of my life. Yeah. You see, it is risk. It is risk. We need adventure and we need battle. This is so core to the masculine soul. You need adventure and you need battle. And God will introduce those challenges into your life. And most guys just go straight to, screw you, man. Like, you're yeah. not helping. When instead, it... it it's, oh, I am being initiated. It's in the challenge that my masculinity is formed and strengthened and that a sense of identity comes out of that. I think you're right on, Matt. It's very, very interesting. Like reflecting back to my, you know, late teens, early 20s, I was constantly putting myself in situations. Like I was so hungry for adventure. And I come through like a lot of physical health stuff. So there's a lot of like pent up. I want to get out there. I want to see the world. I want yeah. to go on all these exploits that I've been reading about and seeing the movies about. And so, you know, I like, you know, went and lived in Africa for a while. And I went to Nepal and I went to Iceland. And I lived in New York City working with homelessness and gangs. And like all these kind of like quite like hard ass macho macho kind of stuff. Right. And that was unbelievably gratifying. Some of the most challenging and formative uh, times in my life whatsoever but towards the end of that season I kind of started to to have this feeling where it's like is this it like is this all there is like I've done the adventure I've done the Instagram stuff and there but there has to be something more and it's really interesting because that's whenever my now wife came into my life and I started off on this whole different adventure that was exponentially more difficult than any mountain that I ever climbed. And then, you know, then you move into fatherhood. I would love to, to know for yourself, how did you navigate becoming a father yourself and becoming a husband whenever you carried a lot of that baggage from your own dad? You know, it's something that I hear the young guys that I mentor say all the time is, I'm determined not to become like my dad. Yeah. But there's almost this weird thing where despite our best efforts, it's like the more we try to run the opposite direction, we mm. end up becoming the very thing that we, we, we set out to avoid becoming. So yeah. that's a bit of a ramble, but I think you can pick that up. Yeah, no, it's good. Um, I'm just going to cut to the chase here, guys, and say you're not going to get past all that till you forgive him. Mm. You got to forgive your dad. 
Um, and now, like, there's a whole bunch of different guys listening. You know, some of you, it was just your dad was just silent. He was a good guy. He worked hard, but he never really said much to you and didn't tell you he believed in you and you have what it takes and tell you he loved you. And then it gets pretty bad from there, right? You get into some of the, you know, the abandonment or the alcohol or the violence and the abuse. But the the turning point for me was the day that I had to forgive my dad mm. and, and just say, look, he was a broken man himself. And uh, I forgive you because I don't want to hold this anger in my heart against you anymore. It's shaping me now. You know, like you said, I'm becoming like you. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I think we just got to be honest and say, you got to get to a point where you forgive him. Yeah. Um, but, but the thing about, yeah. So you were talking about moving into fatherhood and marriage first and fatherhood. Um, so because of, because of abandonment, um, and, and being almost like a street kid myself, I had made this deep childhood vow. I will never need anyone. And, and then I get married and my wife, three years into our marriage, my, my wife, Stacy says, I think we should get divorced. <laughs> and, and I'm like, what? I'm a great guy. What are you talking about? <laughs> Internally. I didn't say that. Out loud. Like, but what she basically said was, you don't need me. Uh, I'm optional here. And, and I just realized, oh my gosh, like I had made that vow as a boy. I will never need anyone. And I'm still mm -hmm. living that out. And it's time to get past that now and to let, let people into my life, let love into my heart and to, yeah, to open up to my wife. And I said, well, I don't, I don't want to get divorced. I don't want this story to end like that. What do we need to do? So we went and got some marriage counseling. But more importantly, it was really for me that vow or literally breaking that vow of I'll never need anyone mm. and opening my heart up again uh, to love. And, and then the boys come along. I love being a dad. I love it. You guys, if you're not there yet, it, it is phenomenal. It, yes, it's scary. Yes, it's going to take you to the end of your resources, but it's phenomenal. It's just been the greatest joy of my life. And and my three adult sons now, like we adventure together, like we, we bow hunt, we ride motorbikes, we, you know, we fly fish together. Um, I love being a dad. But in those early years of having little boys, I talked about the rage mm. and the rage started coming out at them. And here's the thing, like if a man, this, this is back to the core need, if a man doesn't feel powerful He's going to either pull back and hide. And so he doesn't talk to his kids. He hides at work. He doesn't talk to his wife. He doesn't feel powerful at home. Or he's going to start being like really controlling, over, over, over powerful, like rage, yeah. you know, anger stuff. And for me, I had to go deal with that rage. And then that's when I went for the first time myself to a therapist and just said, Hey, I've got a rage issue. I really need some help with like the, the love opening yourself up to love, to marriage and parenting is going to be the most phenomenal experience of your life. And you are going to need to deal with your stuff. Yeah. That's a good thing. <laughs> uh, I've been thinking a lot about that idea of, cause I totally agree with you. Like a man needs to feel powerful. Um, I also believe that, you know, a lot of the, say, traits of what the world kind of throws around in that very loose, grotesque term, toxic masculinity, is men who don't feel powerful going out and trying to, to take power from other people. You know, I don't know if it was you or somebody else said it, but I, I love that. You know, the, the difference between toxic masculinity and healthy masculinity is masculinity offers strength for the benefit of others and toxic masculinity takes from other people and i i really that that distinction for me has been really helpful i also it's worked really well for me the difference between lust and love in like a sexual dynamic is lust is something that takes and i i've always just found that to be very encouraging as a man to see that actually there are those two choices in front of you and even just in the moment you know whether it's 
with my wife or with my kid. It's like, am I taking or am I giving in that moment? So I guess the question in there is, what does healthy masculinity look like? You know, like sell us the dream here. Like, why should we, we, yeah. we work through our stuff and yeah. what yeah. do we benefit so from it? It was the American Psychological Association that actually came out with that term toxic max masculinity. And I read their report and what they were primarily talking about was men who are out of touch with their emotions. Whoa. Don't make good parents. That's the point they were trying to make. And I would agree with it. I'm like, yeah, if you're out of touch, then you're going to be stop crying, man up, you know, and, and that is not when your little boy is crying. That's not what you say to him. Um, and so healthy masculinity is a man who is in touch with his own heart. He's, he is aware of his own inner life, his hopes, his dreams, his wounds, his heartaches. OK, he's not just trying to bury all that stuff. He's actually on the healing journey. And, and this is this takes enormous courage. Like, to be honest, you know, I, I love mountain biking. It, it's so much easier than being in relationship with a woman. <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest, right? Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Give me yeah. give me a physical dragon to actually slay, and I'll Come take on. it any day over, like, a difficult conversation with my exactly. wife. Exactly. <laughs> right. But see, that's where courage is really being called out of you. Yeah. And as you walk into that courage and you taste it, you actually want more. So what's healthy masculinity? Healthy masculinity is a deep sense of strength. Mm. I do have what it takes offered on behalf of others. And my strength is for you. I'm here for you. You know, and so it's not just the next triathlon. It's not just, you know, the next uh, Monroe you're going to climb. You know, it's it it. it those things are good and they nourish the masculine soul, but ultimately is I am developing a sense of strength that I can offer to other people. Mm. Wow. I love that. How can a man feel powerful? Because what you said earlier resonated with me whenever you say, you know, men need to feel powerful. And then I was like mulling over my head and I was like, okay, what does that actually look like? I'm going to, I'm going to describe it and then I'm going to give you a very simple test Great. for the guys listening. So it comes in two ways. That core question, do I have what it takes? Mm -hmm. You need to have people who can speak into your life and tell you that. But you also need to experience it. OK, so here's the practical thing. Walk into your fears. Mm. What, what are your fears, guys? What are you afraid of right now? Where's the frontier for you? Are you afraid of asking that girl out? Are you afraid of taking that job or trying to get that job? Are you afraid of university? Uh, walk into it. You, you got to walk into your fears because that is where that deep sense of strength is going to be developed. I wanted to show you this. Uh, I have this pinned in uh, multiple places in my life. I'll hold it up and then I'll read it to you. It's a Joseph Campbell <laughs> quote. Yes. And it says, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. And I'm a big hero's journey guy. Like, I love it. Like, I'm in the storytelling business and I, I, you know, I pull from it all the time. I remember one of the most mind-boggling moments was sitting in a, in a script writing uh, masterclass one day and the highly secular professor stood up in front of the room and said, for your homework, I want you to go home and read the Gospel of Mark because it's one of the greatest hero's journeys ever written. And I was like, whoa, wow. this is exciting. This is very, very cool. And I, like you, have made different vows throughout my life. Like one of my big vows was I'm never going to get married, right? I saw my, my parents divorced. You know, I saw a whole bunch of different stuff. The second one was I'm never going to go to university. And I think the journey that I've been going, going on over the last decade or maybe have been brought on is a better way to put it, is facing each of those fears head on. And then whenever the next kind of fear steps up where it's like, okay, now I've done this. I'm definitely not doing that. And then it's like the tap on the shoulder and it's like, no, 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 that's exactly where you're going next. Yeah. And I, I found that to be yeah. unbelievably formative and gratifying. And with it, you know, the difference in, in who I am today versus who I was even even at 21 or 22 is 
I feel more and more that I have what it takes in your language. And it's only been by facing down some of those dragons and, and going into those caves. It's it's yeah. very exciting. Yeah, but but I know just enough of your story, but it also involves knowing that you're loved. Mm. You know, this isn't just about being a really tough guy. It's it's yeah. not. It's not. That's the world's like cartoon version, you know. The the Bruce Willis die hard, you know, <laughs> kind of stuff. Uh. Right? And and so guys, you gotta come back. Actually, a little boy, I said he has he has one core question, but he has two core needs. Every little boy needs to know that his dad loves him. And then he needs to know that he has what it takes. And you can't you can't ignore that other piece, which which again, guys who are walking in a faith context understand like there is a father who loves you. Mm. He really does. And he's not weird and he's not religious and he's not far away. And and the cool thing is he loves the things you love. You will find him in the things you love. If it's the sea uh, or, or, or if it's sport or if it's it's university, if it's study, if it's books, if it's music, he's in the things you love. He's pursuing you right there. So to know to know that you have a father who loves you. And he thinks you have what it takes. That'll change your life. One of the questions that I, I had here was, you know, like, what do you make of the the massive kind of cult like followings that have been built around guys like Andrew Tate and Liver King and the list goes on and on and on. But I think you actually just answered it. It's it's the cartoonish nature of some of those online personalities it's like a false father figure where it's the, I don't know what your, your generation's version of it would have been. Like I imagine like maybe like some sort of like Clint Eastwood type of person right? where, where it's like, it's got all the tough, but it's got none of the tender. And what you're saying is actually the tender is where a lot of the gold is as well. Absolutely. Cause it takes more courage. It takes much more courage. Wow. And it's also a core human need. You can't live without it. You know, I tried to live without love for a lot of years and I was a very successful, driven guy. Mm. And I actually had my boss, my boss pulled me aside one day, took me to lunch and he said, John, do you know that you intimidate everybody in this department? <laughs> I could have laughed because inside I still felt scared. I felt wow. like the scared boy, but I was just living only tough and no tender. Mm. I was a two-dimensional man, not a three-dimensional, not a whole human being. Wow. So op opening your heart up to love is is uh, essential to being a, a human being. John, two more questions, and then we're going to uh, land the plane. We don't really have time to unpack this, but I would like to kind of maybe uh, signpost this next kind of question and, and say there's lots of, there's an amazing chapter in your book, Wild at Heart, that covers this. But talk to me about this idea of a man bringing some of those core questions that you talked about to the woman. Give mm -hmm. me a little bit on that. Yeah, okay. So if he doesn't know he has what it takes, the big lie in the world is the woman can tell you. So get the beautiful girl, sleep with a bunch of girls, you know, uh, marry, marry a woman who thinks you're amazing that's going to answer your question. But we were talking about the masculine journey. A woman cannot tell you who you are as a man. It comes only from a masculine source. And so guys get angry at their wives or they run from their girl or they just go through woman, woman, woman after, you know, because mm. she can't answer your question, fellas. Yeah. That's, that's, and if you take your question to the woman, you're going to find yourself afraid of her. And you don't want to be afraid of the women in your life. It's so interesting you said that. I was listening to a podcast on the weekend. I think it was with a guy called Dennis Prager. I know nothing about him other than the episode that I listened to. And he defined masculinity as someone who's not afraid of women. <laughs> and I thought that was a really, really unique take, you know, where you can... You can stand face to face with women in your life and you can be who you are rather than bending 
because of fear or because of a desire to please or a desire of whatever. And I just thought that was really remarkable. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I would add, especially the women close to you. Yeah. Right. The women who know you, who read your mail. (laughs) Absolutely. Closing up then, John, uh, before I ask you to kind of maybe give a couple of like what's next if people have have really enjoyed this conversation and and they want to find out more how can they go deeper it's kind of a a two-pronged approach i suppose the first one is what can i do for the young men in my life and the second part is northern ireland is a really small place right where i'm from it's two million people and in the market research world, Northern Ireland is often used to test new ideas, test new products, see how it goes before they kind of roll it out into a larger marketplace. Mm-hmm. So I think Northern Ireland kind of always has a unique opportunity to to be this amazing force for change in the world. And I just was thinking on the bus on the way in this morning, I was like, dude, like, how would a nation like Northern Ireland change that is crippled by you know, young men taking their lives and addiction and depression and, and broken relationships. Like if all of us as men in a small country like this rose up and took our place, like how would our nation change? I know that's quite a big way to end, but I was curious. <clears throat> so it was a two part question. The first part was what can we do for young guys around us? And I would say, bring them along. Whatever you're doing, if you're working in the yard, ask them to come. If you're taking out a boat to sail for the for the weekend, ask them to come. If you're going to go for a hike, ask them to come. Bring them along because it's the companionship and the conversation that is so healing to young men. Reach out. Invite them in. Invite them in. Whatever it is you're doing, you know, you're making a nice meal tonight. Invite them in. Show them how to how to how to be a chef. Um and then for the country, you know, um, Matt, I, you know that I was just up in Northern Ireland back in the in November, and I was really struck by the country is still traumatized. Yeah. Um, and you got to admit that. And and how are you going to get past all that? I mean, what, what's with the alcohol and the addiction? <laughs> what's what's with the the um, the suicide and the depression? Uh, you're going to have to forgive. Mm. You're going to have to forgive uh, your the past to get past it. You got to forgive it, uh, and I, and you got to form these bands of brothers. You you need some brothers. You got to get a guys around a campfire. Get a guys in the back room of a pub. Get a guys after the gym. Go out for coffee. You you got to get get with small groups of guys. Because if the whole country starts doing that, I'm telling you, there's going to be such healthy masculinity happening. Marriages get better. Kids get better. And then all of the indicators. uh, Kids do well in school when their dad's involved. Kids do well in sports when their dad's involved. Kids do well in their careers when their dad's involved. They don't do drugs. They're not struggle with depression and anxiety when their dad's involved. It heals so much. When you heal, Matt. John, thank you uh, for the great conversation and also for this. This is definitely going to be one of my new uh, put this everywhere. Bring them along. I love that. Like that is uh, if you don't have that on Wild at Heart merch, you got to get that on a (laughs) T-shirt or something, some sort of product where you can get that message out there, because I think that is it's absolutely uh, hits the nail on the head. Where can we go next? So for you know, the person listening to this who they feel that kind of stir in their, in their heart, they're pumped up, they feel like taking some sort of an action, where can they put some of that energy? Yeah, you know, guys, uh, if you haven't read Wild at Heart, I really encourage you. It's a book I wrote about men and about the healing journey, the masculine journey. It's helped a lot of guys, uh, yeah. faith or no faith, uh, from South America to Russia to the inner city, New York, guys have really found it to be helpful. I'd just start there. Read Wild yeah. at Heart. Awesome. And I can totally endorse that. I read it when I was 16 with that small group of guys, you know, the 16-year-olds, my, my mates at the time, and made a huge impact on us then. And funny, whenever you, you came to North Island recently, we all kind of, we picked it up again and we got the new edition and we started going through it, me and some of the guys closest to me. And it's unbelievable, actually, 
just to encourage you as a as a man as an author you know we read that book when we were 16 and we thought we thought we understood it all we thought we got it all we thought we were like okay and then you know now maybe 12 years later or whatever it is to come back to it was so so powerful because it actually was like a mirror that we were able to hold up to ourselves and reflect yeah. on how much we've changed and how yeah. far we've come in certain areas of our journey. So thank you for the work that you and your yeah. wife and your team do. And thank you so much for today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Matt, you're you're a really good man and you clearly have what it takes. <laughs> That's the best sign off I've ever had on an episode ever. <laughs> Thanks, John. Appreciate it.